Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thanks so much for coming out. Uh, so my name is Jordan Pasternak. I'm going to be talking about uh, ankle replacements today. Um, I don't have any disclosures. Um, so this is the ankle joint. Um, the ankle is a pretty complex joint. Um, it does consist of three bones, um, the tibia, the talus, and the fibula, and a lot of different muscles and tendons and ligaments that sort of surround it, help it move, uh, and stabilize it. So what is a total ankle replacement? Well, it's similar uh, in basic principle to a knee or hip replacement, which pretty much everyone is familiar with. Um, so you have metal components that replace the usually arthritic ends of the two bones, the distal end of the tibia, and the, the dome of the talus. Um, and usually there's an uh, articulating plastic piece uh, in between, uh, which is polyethylene. And these are just some x-rays uh, and a diagram of what an ankle replacement looks like. So who gets a total ankle replacement? Um, typically patients that have arthritis of the ankle. Now, arthritis of the ankle isn't usually like hip or knee. It's usually post-traumatic, some type of fracture or injury or something that precipitates ankle arthritis. Uh, there are other types of arthritis in the ankle as well, uh, such as rheumatoid arthritis, uh, that can also be indicated for an ankle replacement. Um, specifically, patients who have ankle motion, even though that they have arthritis. So having an ankle replacement won't increase the motion that your ankle has, but it will preserve it. Um, and we're gonna talk about sort of the other alternative to treatment for ankle arthritis in a second, um, but that is a difference, that this preserves motion. Um, patients who don't need uh, to participate in really high impact uh, activities or, or activities that put large forces across the joint, things that are like cutting and running and pivoting and jumping. Um, people who should not have a total ankle replacement, people who have you know, active infection, if they have uh, peripheral neuropathy, if they have uh, vas you know, substantial vascular disease of the lower extremity, um, and if they don't have uh, adequate soft tissues to cover up the replacement. <coughs> Um, and so this is just an example of ankle arthritis. On the left side, top and bottom, uh, you see what, is, what can be thought of as a normal ankle x-ray without arthritis. Um, and on the right side, top and bottom, you see a very extreme example of what ankle arthritis looks like on an x-ray. So before ankle replacements became uh, good and popular, um, the gold standard was an ankle fusion. And so essentially what an ankle fusion is, is where you eliminate the ankle joint. Um, the goal of this surgery was to alleviate the pain from arthritis, but in so doing, you are also eliminating any motion of the ankle joint afterwards. Um, this is not some historic procedure. These are still performed routinely today, and there is definitely a role for this surgery. Um, you have a patient's own bone growing across the joint, and these, these procedures, uh, in contrast to what I was saying earlier, these procedures are better for patients who have higher demands of their ankle. These are patients who are putting a lot of force along the ankle, such as farmers, construction workers, things like that. Um, and this is an example of an x-ray uh, of what different types of ankle fusions look like. But essentially, the principle is the same. You are eliminating the ankle joint, eliminating pain, but also motion. So there are some inherent challenges in total ankle replacement. Um, and this is going to be uh, something I sort of come back to a few times because the differences between total ankle replacement and hip and knee replacements are largely due to this. So the, the load-bearing area, essentially the surface area of the ankle joint, is much less than a hip or a knee. But the forces that go across the ankle, even with walking, are significantly higher than the hip or the knee. So the forces that go across the ankle joint uh, with different activities can range from anywhere from one and a half to seven times body weight. So that's a lot of force over a small area. So that creates some challenges, um, sort of engineering challenges in designing a reliable implant. Um, additionally, the ankle is a complex joint. There's not just up and down motion, but there actually is slight uh, rotational and translational motion as shown here in this diagram. So in the, historically, the first generation of total ankle replacements started in the 70s and 80s. Um, these were highly constrained implants, meaning they did not allow for much motion uh, between themselves. Um, they use cement to secure themselves, as Dr. Shu was talking about earlier, um, like with the knees. Um, and because of this amount of constraint and because of the cement, uh, there were issues with loosening of the implants because they were subject to high forces. And there was also some bone loss, or what's called osteolysis, around the implants because of that high level of constraint. And so these are just some pictures of what these might have looked like, the first generation implants, um, as well as x-rays of them being implanted. Then you know, a decade or two later, we get the second generation of total ankles. Now these are three component systems. We've added that plastic piece in, that polyethylene piece. Um, the plastic uh, could be 
sort of incorporated in one of two ways. So the plastic could be either attached to one of the metal components, and that's what we call a fixed bearing implant, or it could be allowed to move freely amongst the angle between the two metal implants. Um, that would be called a mobile bearing angle. Um, here, additional focus was put on removing less bone. So the less bone you could remove, the better. Um, and then at this point is when cement sort of starts to phase out. Um, we focus more on the bony ingrowth that Dr. Chu had talked about earlier in his talk about knees. And again, here's just an example um, of what the implant may have looked like in an x-ray of one of these implants implanted. Um, the third generation, we're still sort of in at the tail end of it. Um, here, some of these implants have added, and, um, excuse me, added an independent plastic piece, sort of a mobile-bearing meniscus, if you will. Um, again, we're, we're tr always trying to minimize the amount of bone we have to remove in doing a total ankle replacement. And here we're depending more upon the patient's native anatomy to help sort of balance and stabilize the ankle replacement. Um, and again, just demonstrative examples of what a third generation implant and x-ray would look like. And so where are we mostly today? So the newest technology are these so-called fourth generation ankle implants. Um, the goal is to try and mimic the ankle's natural shape and kinematics as much as possible. Um, this is an example of what one of those implants would have looked like and what it looks like on an x-ray. Um, and a lot of these newer implants are coming out with something called PSI, which is patient-specific instrumentation. Patient-specific instrumentation essentially is when the patient has a CAT scan of their ankle with a sp specific protocol before the surgery. Then engineers meet with the surgeon to design the ideal size and location of the implants and where, the, where that should go given the patient's current anatomy and any deformities that they may have. 3D printing is then utilized to create custom jigs that are actually used in the surgery to precision guide the cuts that are made on each of the bones. So essentially you're planning the exact location of bone cuts, the exact location and size of implants from this CAT scan. And so this is, this is sort of state-of-the-art emerging technology. Um, and this is just an example um, of what these jigs would look like that are custom 3D printed, molded to, fate, you know, to fit on this uh, specific patient's uh, tibia over here and help guide the cuts. So in terms of surgical technique, most total ankle replacements today, not all but most, are put in from the front, an anterior approach. Um, essentially what you do is you carefully move the soft tissues out of the way to get down to the ankle joint itself. You cut the ends of the tibia and the talus in the proper alignment in all three planes. And again, this can be assisted if you are utilizing the patient-specific instrumentation beforehand. Um, and then you may balance the soft tissues as needed so the ankle sits in appropriate spot and allows for appropriate motion. Again, this is about sparing motion. You would place trial implants in, so these are not the implants that you would uh, end up with, but these are sort of the same size and location and just make sure and affirm that this is correct. You would adjust anything that needs adjusting with these trial implants in, and then you would put the real implants in and then close everything up. Um, and these are just some case examples of what this would look like from the front and what the actual implants look like when implanted. Um, these are some x-rays. Uh, x-ray is used throughout the case to help guide exact position and trajectory of cuts and implants. Um, and this is just an example of what this would look like uh, throughout the case. Here you can see uh, sizing and preparation of the bone cuts ready to receive the implants. And this is what the finished product would look like on an x-ray. So what does post-operative recovery look like? So most of the current implants, as I said, cement has largely been abandoned. So most of the current implants do require bony ingrowth for fixation. Um, as a result of the need for bony ingrowth, and in addition to the fact that, again, the ankle is smaller than a knee or hip and has increased forces applied to it more than a knee or hip, um, typically the um, the patient is not allowed to weight bear on that extremity for four to six weeks to allow for bony ingrowth. Then you're walking typically in, about a boot for, uh, in a boot for about four weeks. Your total recovery until you're sort of out doing all of your activities is usually just under three months. Um, and again, because of the sort of inherent engineering challenges with the ankle, being that it's a small joint that sees an incredible amount of force with different activities, some of the higher impact activities do tend to be restricted after a total ankle replacement. Um, so I'm just going to present some literature here. So, uh, you know, we talked about the sort of brief history of total ankle replacement, and it's been 
you know, getting better and better with each generation. Um, and we see that when we look at trends. So when we look at what's being done for ankle arthritis in terms of is it, you know, a replacement or a fusion? When we look from 2007 to 2013 in this study, the share of total ankle replacements being performed for ankle arthritis grew from 14% to 45%. And if you look at this chart, you can essentially see the two lines are converging. They have actually already crossed. So there, today in America, there are more total ankle replacements being done for ankle arthritis than ankle fusion. Um, so this is not some sort of emerging new concept. This is, this is mainstream now, and this is being done. Um, this is a, a study of comparing total ankle replacement to ankle fusion in patients navigating stairs uh, and uneven surfaces. So how do these patients do afterwards, whether you have a fusion or an ankle replacement? Um, this was a prospective study. Patients were evaluated before surgery, six months after surgery, and 12 months after surgery on stairs, an incline ramp, and an uneven surface. Preoperatively, before surgery, there were no differences between the two groups. Both groups did improve and had high satisfaction. But the patients who had ankle replacements, as one might expect, did perform significantly better with walking upstairs, walking downstairs, and walking uphill. Obviously, the total ankle patients also, as you would expect, had increased motion compared to the ankle fusion patients because the goal of ankle fusion is to eliminate motion. Um, this is a study comparing, remember we had talked earlier about mobile bearing and fixed bearing, so is the plastic piece attached to the metal or is it sort of free floating within the ankle? Um, this, again, was a prospective uh, insti uh, single institution randomized control trial, a very high level of evidence in medicine. There were 84 patients, almost even amounts of mobile bearing and fixed bearing patients. The average follow-up was about four and a half years. Um, and so they looked at PROs, what we call, which are patient reported outcomes, surveys that patients fill out, seeing how they're doing, um, physical examinations, and x-rays. And essentially what they found is both groups did well, there were no significant differences in terms of patient reported outcomes, what patients filled out on surveys or said. Um, the mobile bearing implants, the ones that are sort of where the plastic is free floating, did have a higher percentage of, on x-ray of cis formation in the talus, um, component malalignment or misalignment, and extra bone formation, which is called heterotopic ossification. Um, the disclaimer here being that all of these findings were radiographic. Just because you see something on an x-ray does not necessarily mean the patient is suffering or having an adverse outcome from that. But that's essentially what this study found. Um, we'll just breeze over that. That's essentially what we were just talking about. Um, and this is a study talking about uh, the patient-specific instrumentation that I had mentioned earlier. Um, so this is a retrospective multi-center study of 44 patients who had a total ankle implanted using that patient-specific instrumentation, that CT scan that creates 3D custom jigs for each patient. 80% um, of the patients had an implant placed within three degrees of their preoperative plan. When you jump to four degrees, it became almost 90%. And within five degrees, every single patient uh, had a total ankle placed that was according to the plan. So, every, so you, essentially using patient-specific instrumentation, you are within five degrees of what is gonna you know, end up being implanted for that patient. Tibial size, the, in terms of sizing of the implants, so that's location, um, sizing of the implants, the tibial component size was accurately predicted in almost every case, 98% of the cases, and tailor component size was correctly predicted in 80%, still high, but not quite as high as tibial. Thank you all very much.